Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to Holding Space, a national conversation series with libraries. Before we get started, we want to recognize and thank our hosts, Hey Miss Pueblo Community Library in New Mexico, Arlen J. Sando, Kasi K, or Chief of Hey Miss Pueblo and Tribal Archivist, Hey Miss Pueblo Community Library and Archivist is going to open our event. Welcome, welcome. I want to do an opening welcome in our Toa language. The Toa language is the official language of our Hamas Pueblo people. Greetings, greetings to all, uh, whoever, wherever part of the world you may be viewing from. A uh, very warm welcome from the land of enchantment, the state of New Mexico. I welcome you on this wonderful day today from Jemez Pueblo, New Mexico. I am Pequaguin of the Corn Clan. Uh, my English name is Arlen Sandal. I am the head cacique, uh, the chief of my village, community, and tribe of Jemez Pueblo. In my opening welcome, I gladly welcome the great sun, our spirits, on this beautiful day, thank them for a brand new day and the gifts that they brought for us today. And one of them is to is that they have linked us all today for this virtual gathering. And and uh, virtual gathering of uh, information agents. And 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 um, I just like to welcome you. I ask the spirits to guide us, give us the strength, courage to keep you safe and sound so that you may continue to assist your patrons in your respective communities, towns, cities, states, nationwide, worldwide, all communities on Mother Earth. And in whatever capacity your, your involvement may be in, uh, I hope you continue to bring happy tears, those tears of joy from the patrons, those tears of joy that you bring, you bring to them. And I just give you thanks and appreciate your, your hard work. Uh, your professions are very important and I appreciate that all you do to support and support one another um, and obtain support that you may need. And uh, that's one of the reasons why we're here today, where some of our um, Pueblo tribes came together to bring a new method of learning to our homelands. It's great that these projects were started a couple years before and before all this chaos through this coronavirus pandemic. Um, education in rural New Mexico is challenging and but you know with determination uh, 
we managed to make it work, to make things work. And some of those stories and some of those involved in some of these projects, you will hear from shortly. But um, I just hope you will gain knowledge uh, from this presentation panel. And I hope that this will introduce and create opportunities, especially to our young ones who will start their schooling uh, differently. And I hope they will utilize this new way uh, and the new tools to learn and receive their fair education. Uh, I certainly hope that they will use the new way of learning to their advantage and hopefully stay away from uh, other things that harm you, harassing other peers, but hope, hopefully this will be a, become a great thing. And just like to thank you. I hope you have a wonderful day. I hope visual, virtual learning makes it easier for our rural region and hope that we will all soon turn to our traditional instruction. And I hope we will soon bring back these books that we have here on the shelves, uh, bring, them, bring them back to life or uh, any books that will, will be on the shelves in schools, libraries, institutions, and hopefully bring back that joy in our patrons and hopefully they'll, they'll be returning to visit their local libraries pretty soon. So welcome, welcome again. And I appreciate Hamas Pueblo hosting this virtual meeting. So welcome, Mr. Jefferson, and all, all who are participating in this event today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Sando. That was beautiful. And we are honored to be welcomed so graciously to Hamas Pueblo Community Library, where today we'll be talking about broadband access and the critical role of libraries in their communities. On this tour, we've already talked about the statistics that became difficult to ignore as much of the country shifted to learning and working remotely due to the coronavirus pandemic. But I think that many people are unaware just how sharp the disparity in access to broadband on tribal lands is. In 2018, the FCC estimated that more than one in three residents living on tribal land lack access to broadband. Right now, that effectively cuts people off from access to healthcare, education, and work. It also makes activities like census completion much more difficult. As the leading provider of free internet and technology access and training, including in tribal communities, libraries, have been key to connectivity for many people on tribal lands and across the country. But there are unique challenges when it comes to improving broadband access in tribal lands. Today, we're going to hear from some extraordinary innovators who have found a way to move towards greater connectivity. I am pleased to welcome and introduce our panelists. Once again, Arlen J. Sando, Kakasi, or Chief of Jemez Pueblo and Tribal Archivist, Jemez Pueblo Community Library and Archives. Congressman Ben Ray Lujan, New Mexico's third congressional district. Sonia Lopez, field representative in the office of Congressman Ben Ray Lujan. Maureen Wakando, librarian at Jemez Pueblo Community Library and Archives. Kimball Sikwa Katua, Chief Technology Director at Santa Fe Indian School. Aaron Laframboise, Director of Library Services at Blackfeet Community College in Montana, who also joins us as a representative of the American Indian Library Association. And Marika Beeser, Senior Policy Advocate at the American Library Association. Uh, we wanna say that Congress, Congressman Luan, I know you have a hectic schedule, so we're so delighted you could join us today. So I just wanted to say hello to you and remind us where you're, where you're coming from today. Uh, today, uh, Mr. Jefferson, it's an honor to be with you, sir, and all of these incredible panelists uh, who I've had the honor of working with and learning from. 
um, and especially the great work of Kimball, who, who I know has caught the attention of people all across America, including the FCC. But I bring you greetings from Nambe, New Mexico, uh, which is my home. I'm fourth generation on this small little farm here. Um, and uh, behind me, you can see part of the sheep barns, I believe. Off to my right here, you'll see this little area here. Um, but uh, this is where I grew up, sir. And it's great to be able to welcome everyone to New Mexico. We hope someday to welcome you in person here soon as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, I think today we're going to just go ahead and get started. Um, and um, we can't discuss broadband for tribal libraries without addressing equity. But I'd like to start with a success story, or at least a success journey, about how MS Pueblo Community Library and neighboring Pueblos brought improved broadband access to this library in this community. So I want to start with Maureen. Uh, Maureen, could you start us off first by introducing us to your library and then sharing your story about bringing greater connectivity to your community? Maureen? Is Maureen with us? And you have to go ahead and unmute. There we go. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello, welcome to the Jemez Pueblo Community Library in Jemez Pueblo, New Mexico. My name is Maureen Wakando and I am the interim librarian here at the library. Uh, the, the conversation started in 2014, I believe, and the actual E-rate uh, construction completed in the summer of 2016. Uh, before E-rate, uh, we were working with Windstream and we were on a 10 DSL and I upgraded to a 20 DSL. However, the only thing that changed was the cost. I was actually paying double. Um, we serve a population, or the Jemez Pueblo is a population about 3,332. 2,219 living on the Pueblo and about 16,632 uh, living off. Um, in the past 15 years, uh, fluent TOA speakers have decreased from over 90% to 80%. And uh, that has become some worrisome to our tribal uh, leadership, tribal administration, and there are. Uh, when E-rate came, came alive and, and was here in the library, I always remember that day and I wish I had recorded it. The children after school they get off at three o'clock and they're practically running to the library, which we miss very much. And they're waiting in line to sign in and then rush to the computers. And once they get there, they log in and then they upload whatever educational games that they're going to play. And then they form little groups and be chatting until the game uploads. And this day that E-rate was taking over, I sat there and I, I wanted to see the faces on these children. One of them actually stayed at the computer station and logged on. And once they did, he says, hey, the, the game is on, it's uploaded. We don't have to wait, what happened? And all the children were like, what? And they rushed to their computers and then they all looked at me and they asked me, what happened? <laughs> the, the looks on these children's faces was priceless. And I'll always remember that day. And I'm so thankful for everyone who came together to bring E-Rate alive. It wasn't easy. It was a lot of work, a lot of meetings, a lot of meetings that we had to attend a lot of things that I had to learn. I actually remember being in meetings and words I not ever heard of 
writing them down and, and actually coming into the library and researching. That was a lot of work. And I'm very thankful for everybody that came together and supported the E-Rate project. And um, the uh, library programs that we do offer here, we do have books and DVD, uh, books and DVD collection, ebook collection access. We have year round reading clubs, uh, the New Mexico State Library Interloan Program, uh, computer usage, which is, uh, act, uh, we help with one-on-one -on -one, um, online job searches, um, resume development and so forth. But now with this pandemic, a lot of things have changed. Um, our whole world pretty much has changed. Our way of life, it, it has been one tough, trying path we've been on. And uh, I try to uh, remain open and try to help the community as much as I could. At the same time, try to stay safe and not try to form gatherings. But the internet Wi-Fi parking lot access was very useful. People were parking in the parking lot and using the Wi-Fi without getting out of their vehicles. People would knock on the door, either call me on the library phone uh, so that I could, um, they either wanted to fax something or scan to email because life was still happening regardless of this pandemic. And I felt that I needed to help my community members um, with whatever that they may have needed. Um, and so from there on, I've been helping people with unemployment, stimulus, um, the online uh, renewals for MVD and so forth. Um, it's been one challenging time. We really miss the children. We uh, would have Head Start visits normally um, starting soon and we'd be preparing in uh, September is when we usually get their first visit. And they come into the library and we uh, have uh, introduction, the first visit, and then there on after, depending on what curriculum they're learning, uh, we would read a book in our Toa language and then um, um, we did have the discussion at the end where children are actually repeating the names of whether it be animals or whatnot. And then afterwards, um, they would leave and then the next group will come in. So from the time that they come in to the time we leave, they leave, nothing but the Toa language is spoken. And that's for all school visits and any patrons that come into the library. Uh, and then we have our summer reading programs one which is Stories from the Land program that is done in the Toa language. And now with everything going virtual, we're trying to find creative ways to still connect with our children, our patrons, and provide the programs that we used to, um, but with them being in their respective homes and uh, hopefully you know, we'll be able to deliver um, the materials that are needed and continue moving forward with all the programs that we have developed, enhanced. Um, thank you very much for your time. Um, but it, it has, we have come a very long ways and I'm very thankful for E-Rate because with these trying times and the pandemic that we're in right now, it has been very, very, very helpful to a lot of my community members and I'm sure that a lot of tribal libraries are facing the same difficulties. Some have had to shut down completely. And there are some that just don't have that strong broadband, that internet that people need. We really need help, um, especially during times like this, because we have families that have no way of connecting we have families that don't even know how 
to get on a computer. So we're trying our very best. Thank no, you. No, thank you so much, Maureen. Thank you for sharing that. And I, and I want to kind of turn right now to take a look at the national view. And I want to bring oh, it on here. Um, Congressman, you've been a big supporter of this and, and similar efforts. And I understand you've helped navigate the federal process. Can you talk about what you were hearing from, you, from your constituents and how this project has informed your thoughts about where federal policy is working and not working in through the increasing broadband access to tribal lands? Most certainly. And first off, Mr. Jefferson, uh, I failed to thank you at the top of this as well. President of the American Library Association, you've been instrumental in so many uh, pieces of legislation that have ultimately been signed into law. Uh, Ms. Visser, uh, she was instrumental in the work that I've been doing with Senator Martin Heinrich, Congresswoman Deb Holland as well. Uh, but also thank you for the work you do on behalf of uh, the Library of Congress, especially with the C Congressional Research Service. Sir, we depend on you every day. Now here in New Mexico, um, we do have many challenges, but you do have um, two champions, uh, again, that are recognized all across the country. I've had the honor of working uh, and learning and being briefed directly from Kimball. Uh, Maureen, we have seen her program uh, uh, firsthand as well with the work that she is doing with the Hemis Zia Consortium. And of course, with Kimball, with Cochiti, um, Santa Domingo, San Felipe, as well as Santa Ana. And that's just the beginning of what we need to uh, be uh, expanding here in New Mexico, Julius. And what I appreciate most is we invited Commissioner Rosenworcel from the Federal Communication Commission to visit us in New Mexico not long ago. Uh, Kimball gave a firsthand briefing to the commissioner. And uh, over the last two or three weeks, I invited Commissioner Rosenworcel to participate in a virtual town hall here in New Mexico. And the topic, of course, was broadband and connectivity. And what I appreciated that the response from Commissioner Rosenworcel unprompted um, was her observation that the Middle Rio Grande Consortium, the Hemis Zia Pueblo Tribal Consortium, were the national model for how to connect tribal libraries through E-rate. So there's so much we can learn from the leaders here at home. Here in New Mexico, the FCC, the way that they look at our state, 64% of people living on tribal lands lack access to high-speed fixed broadband. So tribal communities, Pueblo communities, um, and rural communities are not connected here in New Mexico. Not only is this vital for learning now that students are not uh, participating in, in uh, classroom uh, learning because of COVID-19, uh, all of the distance learning that's taking place. But whether students are doing in-person learning or distance learning, they need access to the internet. Most of their homework is done on the internet. Their curriculum, the way that their parents engage with teachers and faculty um, at the school, it, it's all done online. It's critically important. Um, in addition to that, Julius, it's also life-saving. Um, we, we sadly remember the loss of young Ashlyn Mike, an 11-year-old, little girl from the Navajo Nation who in 2016, I think it was May 2nd, we sadly lost her. The Amber Alert system wasn't working then either. So expanding connectivity, it's not just to help nourish these young minds, it will save people's lives. We know that. The importance of telemedicine and, and outreach uh, is going to be critically important. But one of the pieces of legislation that I have been proud to work on in a bipartisan uh, basis and in a bicameral basis is the Tribal Connect Act as well, where um, we have been working on it. Uh, we just got word that Congressman from Oklahoma, Mark Wayne Mullins, will be the lead Republican. And while we are introducing it now, uh, which is late in the Congress, uh, we've also been working with Frank Pallone and Greg Walden, the chair of the Energy and Commerce Committee and the ranking member of the Energy and Commerce Committee. And I'm hopeful that we might be able to see a mark um, as early as September on this important piece of legislation, but that's through all of your support. We are also uh, expecting to see an introduction by Senator Heinrich uh, now uh, during uh, this week, uh, as early as Friday. So a lot of progress in that space. And what this comes down to, Julius, is, and I, I've asked every FCC chair that has been before me in the Energy and Commerce Committee, whether in full committee or the telecom committee, why is it that people can get on an airplane in Los Angeles and they can connect when they're on the ground, 
They take off. They're flying at 30,000 feet in that range. They land in New York at LaGuardia or, or JFK, and they stay connected to the inter internet the whole time. But if you're traveling through those little communities beneath the path of that plane, we're not connected. And in the United States of America and around the world, the technology exists to close this gap. Whether we're talking about satellite canopies, we're taking fiber to the curb, uh, fiber to the home, that middle mile, the last mile, um, bridging uh, all of the uh, importance with access to spectrum, which also is something that was part of uh, COVID relief to provide unused spectrum so that tribal communities could get connected. And then also just my last shout out, um, I would say, Mr. Jefferson to Kimball and to Maureen, thank you for all of the Pueblo leaders and all the tribal leaders you've been working with in New Mexico. While there is still a concern that there needs to be an extension of a timeline for many tribes to apply across the United States uh, to take advantage of, of that two and a half gigahertz spectrum in New Mexico, because the leaders on this call, uh, we are in a really strong place. And, and so I wanna thank everyone here. We'll still work to get a further extension. We saw that 30 day notice, uh, but we also wanna make sure that uh, everyone is going to be able to uh, participate. And then lastly, um, we also moved the Moving uh, Forward Act, which was an infrastructure package. It included $100 billion to close the broadband divide in tribal and rural communities. It's sitting on Mitch McConnell's desk. All we need him to do is move a few of these bills and we will see more investment and support to close these digital divides. It's life-saving, it's needed, telemedicine, distance learning, small business support, and life-saving initiatives through Amber Alert are helping to save more and more uh, of, of the missing and murdered indigenous women in New Mexico and across America. That's why this is so important, Mr. Jefferson. Uh, thank you so much, Congressman. And you mentioned Kimball, and I wanna bring Kimball into the conversation because Kimball, you're at Santa Fe Indian School and you were chair of a different consortium that undertook a similar effort. Tell us about your school and your broadband improvement efforts. Yeah, hi, welcome. Um, I'm Kimball and I am the Chief Technology Director at the Santa Fe Indian School. And I just want to say that I certainly did not do this alone. We had an awesome team of different uh, tribal members, education directors, tribal administrators. We had leadership. We had um, outside collaborators. And I can tell you that both the American Library Association and Representative um, Lujan's office were both key uh, players in, in our accomplishments. So I want to acknowledge that off the, off the bat. But when we started this in 2015, we were just trying to solve a problem. We just saw that the libraries were, um, the communities in themselves were so underconnected. And I saw that, um, well, I live in one for one, but from the school's perspective, we had been working so hard since the BTOP era, since the stimulus era, so that's what, 2008, nine, to connect Santa Fe Indian School in Santa Fe, in the capital of New Mexico. And it took probably about four or five years. And we, and we didn't do it by, um, by solving, by being successful with that program. Um, what we did is I started to notice <clears throat> that there was a different network outside school, IT administrators, uh, of, of technologists, and it's really the wide area network um, community it's carriers, um, it's more wholesale. It's not just somebody calling up and saying, connect my home. So it was a different group that we met through that, that process. And we were able finally to bring in um, a provider from the other side of the state um, to get around our, our issue, which was that our incumbent provider wasn't building out fiber optic infrastructure in Santa Fe that we could at any cost subscribe to. So when we did that, we were very excited and I was very proud of myself because it took that long. <laughs> um, and my leadership at the school said, okay, Kimball, um, we've been designing language and culture programming up at in Santa Fe. We're owned and operated by the 19 Pueblos. Um, we teach five dialects here, but it was very challenging to teach it off reservation because when you need a Zuni um, substitute and they're you know 200 miles away you can't find that in Santa Fe very quickly so we thought okay we finally have high-speed internet and we don't write our languages on the whole here in the Pueblos so how can we use technology to assist in this curriculum 
well, we could use video conferencing just like we are now. We don't have to have any printed form that we can refer to. I can practice my speech and, you know, it's, it would be a way to communicate back to community for the teachers, but also for tribal leaders um, to, to um, for our language preservation um, reasons. So my leadership at the school said, Kim will go help them um, go help them set up these programs. So I turned to the communities and I said, hey, we're ready, let's do this, let's do this awesome groundbreaking curriculum. And we realized that nobody could talk back to us and it's because their internet was too slow. And we also knew that the tribal libraries were the places that housed many of these tribal language programs. So they were the ones that we needed to connect. And furthermore, they were in the heart of the community. So if we can connect the tribal library, we've connected deep into the pueblos where they lacked, at, where homes lacked computers and those homes lacked internet access. So we, we um, I was dispatched to try to help um, the libraries take advantage of E-Rate. Myself and the New Mexico State Library um, Tribal Liaison, we pitched E-Rate up and down the middle Rio Grande Pueblo, up and down the Rio Grande, and we had very few takers in that first year. It's because E-Rate's tough. You know, there's a lot of rules, with some, some gotchas in there, and people, these libraries that were just one person shops, you know, where they're doing, wearing 10 hats at any given moment, having to take on the administrative burden for E-Rate to understand the difference between a switch and a router and, you know, between, you know, a Meraki and an Aerohive and make that good decision. It was too much for them to do alone. So um, that first year um, we had one taker are two takers um, and we increased Cochiti Library's um, internet connectivity tremendously. Um, it actually had the capacity of one cell phone. But considering the year before when the whole tribal government and the tribal library shared a T1, so that's like a tenth of one cell phone, you know, we were making progress. So E-Rate modernized that following year and allowed for special fiber construction. So for people that aren't familiar with um, fiber optic technology, you know, it's, it's glass essentially. It's about the diameter of your hair and it transmits light. And it's almost um, infinitely, uh, it almost is limitless in how much data it could send. And it does that because it splits that light into colors, like colors of the rainbow. So the more expensive your equipment is on either side of that light, the more colors you get and the more data you can go through. So it grows. So we're looking at, you know, infrastructure here that has a 20 year lifespan on it from, from when it's put in the ground. So when ERE modernized, they said, if you are really that underconnected and you're paying that much money, too much money for what you get, then we'll allow you to build fiber optic networks. Uh, so we, we looked at each other. There were a couple of us in the room. It was, you know, in back in the back property, back trailer. Nobody was around. And we're like, we think we can. Wait, we think we're the case for this. And we said, okay, well, we're going to go for it. So we wrote our RFP. Um, and then we, we had all the carriers in New Mexico in front of us. And they're trying to get their head around what we wanted to do. And nobody proposed. They kind of just started disappearing. And what we realized is we wanted to do something that um, was going to be expensive. And these are small communities, you know, of, you know, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 people. There's 19 of them in New Mexico. And there's four in between Santa Fe and Albuquerque. Well, there's five. Um, so what we realized is we had to go get all of our neighbors all the way down the route to join. We needed to aggregate our demand and we needed to work together. So we pulled back on the RFP and we went and we got the, the tribes to, to agree. And we had to do that by knocking on doors and convincing the tribal librarian, the tribal administrator and the governor and get to the councils and just to do that due diligence. But the, the project spoke for itself because it was for the kids and the need was so abundant. And regardless of what silo you were previously in, we all equally needed broadband. And it just hadn't occurred to us that we were all trying to solve the same problem independently without working together. So there was a real natural fusion that, um, was that, that we were able to take advantage of. Um, also on the sister side, the Heimazia side, where Ma Maureen and Arlen are, um, we formed a similar consortium on the Hamas. First, it was the two state charter tribal schools in Hamas. 
and the Tribal Library and the Bureau of Indian Education School. We eventually grew that to include the library and the school in, um, in Zia. Unfortunately, the BIE schools weren't allowed to continue on, on our journey, but we were able to put these two consortiums going forward. And what it came out to be, the proposer, was somebody that was actually at that first meeting, but it wasn't a carrier. It was somebody in layer one construction, so that's the cables and the um, conduits and the ethernet and the fiber part of this whole thing that is the internet. And he knew how to construct, so he designed a solution that got us halfway to Albuquerque, 30 miles, in what we would be our own tribally controlled infrastructure. And then it would be really expensive the last 30 miles to go into Albuquerque, but he knew of firms where you could um, light dark fiber. You could lease dark fiber for 20 years, and then you essentially own it. We connected the two and we got to Albuquerque. Um, and without taking up too much more time, I'll just say that it was the power of connecting to Albuquerque that set us up to have the biggest impact. Because our problem for all these six communities now was that we had expensive um, internet and our choices were limited to those extremely slow T1 connections on the whole. Um, so we didn't say, hey, E-Rate, we just want to connect to anybody who will connect us. We said, hey, E-Rate, we want to meet to meet, we want to connect to our network facility in downtown Albuquerque in a building where a bunch of carriers, the wholesale, the big guys come and they have equipment and their equipment plugs into each other, essentially. And that's really all the internet is in the United States, I guess everywhere. It's these big um, fiber optic trunks that meet up in downtown buildings in large cities and connect to each other. So by us being one of those, we essentially positioned ourselves for wholesale pricing using scalable infrastructure that we could turn that knob up when we wanted to. And we formed a very powerful partner with the Albuquerque Gigapop where our equipment co is co-located. And the Albuquerque Gigapop is a public um, network space and it physically connects all the higher ed institutions in New Mexico. Um, furthermore, they are part of um, research and development networks in the national lab space. Um, and one of those networks is called Internet2. And so that's um, K-12 education and certainly not tribal libraries are not usually part of the, that um, that space, but we can be just we've never thought to, you know, connect to it. So now we can design um, that that would be like high performance computing, for instance, that would be where artificial intelligence might be used to develop, um, uh, you know, um, just interactive training modules. How can we use it in our tribal space? We, we have yet to um, figure that out. But I think for me, that's like the most exciting thing in what we did. It's because we've formed a digital space for new collaborations. So that means all of these little tribal libraries don't need to go out and buy a gazillion dollar digital archiving software suite and try to install it, run it, train it, train each person on their own. They can do it together and just have different partition spaces. They can do um, aggregate volume purchasing, you know, for different programmatic efforts. But they can also just dream. So we put in the infrastructure for the next 20 years that's going to set up our tribal libraries to have new capabilities that maybe we haven't even thought about yet. So I'm very excited and, and it was a great team to work with and I'm, and I'm proud of what we did. No, oh, and I'm so proud of what you did. I'm seeing lots of great comments in the chat. And I want to I want to go go even beyond New Mexico and bring Aaron in here. And Aaron, I want to ask you, um, so how does all of this align with your experience at Blackfeet Community College in Montana? Can you introduce us to the community and describe what connectivity for Blackfeet Community College and Blackfeet Nation is like? Sure, okay. I'm Erin LaFromboise. I'm the Director of Library Services at Medicine Spring Library at Blackfeet Community College. The college uh, serves the entire uh, Blackfeet Nation as well as a lot of the non-native communities in the area. The next closest college is about 100 miles away. So we do connect more than just tribal people here. Um, our reservation is 1.5 million acres and we are on two main highways. So here in Browning where uh, the college is located, we actually have excellent broadband. Um, 
because of the, I think the highway access, there have been outside companies who have invested in getting broadband from one of the larger cities to the next across the mountains. So we really benefit here in Browning, um, but you can get even just a mile out of town and you have no service. Um, there's no easy way to get connected, no cheap way to get connected. And um, of course, once we had to send everyone home this spring, we really, we really felt the need for better broadband on the reservation. Um, there are a couple communities. There's uh, Hart Butte, which is 30 miles south and at the southern end of the reservation. And they're right up against the mountain front. They have, I would say, maybe three spots in their little community where you can even get cell phone service. So um, a lot of people about, I'd say about 70% of the people who have internet access have at least cell phone service but in the community of Hart Butte, they have almost zero access. So hotspots don't work. Um, a lot of times satellite internet doesn't work out there. And because they're a small community, they're oftentimes just forgotten. Um, we have about 15,000 people who live on the reservation. Half of those live in the Browning area and the other half, I would say, have little to no connectivity. Um, so here at the college, we are trying our best to, you know, how do we connect our students? How do we connect our community in general? Um, we have pretty strong Wi-Fi, so people can use it in our parking lots. Um, it's been really tough because we've been closed. Uh, our library is both a, um, college library and a community library. So we're, we don't qualify as being called a public library, but we are a community library. So everybody is welcome. Um, and I, I feel like it's, it's really been tough on our community because I see people walk by the door every day and it really, it really hurts not to be able to welcome, welcome them in and let them use the services they need. Um, and I think just in general, our entire community is trying to think about better ways that we can serve people uh, with, the, um, with the access that we currently have, which is very minimal outside of Browning. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Aaron. And, and I wanted to just uh, say that Aaron is a part of my presidential advisory committee. So thank you for that as well. And, and I wanna bring in Marika now because Marika, um, this month ALA, uh, is publishing a case study that includes Santa Fe Indian School. Uh, we'll share that link to the executive summary, which is available now. But Marika, um, what are the top level findings of that report and how does it inform ALA's policy agenda in this conversation that we're having today? Sure, thank you, Julius, and thank you to everybody for helping to tell that story. Um, I will answer your questions, but before I get started, um, I wanted to acknowledge someone who's not here today. Cynthia Aguilar is really my introduction to this story. She's at the Santo Domingo Pueblo Library, and she's the one who brought us in so we could learn about all this great stuff that has happened. Um, so in this is, this is in the report, it's in the executive summary, which I know you're gonna get the link, but we spoke and she really wanted to make one point about why this project and, and the outcome of having this internet connection that as Kimball said is more or less limitless, um, what it means to her and to her Pueblo. Um, so in particular, so I'm gonna read what, what she asked me to say. So she says, we have gone beyond being known as as the underserved and want to step it up and be known as equally served across Indian country. For me as a tribal member bringing fiber optics to Pueblo land, we will be known as equally served for the future. And I think one thing that I've learned from this is that everybody's acting for the future generations. And so we're acting now and we're, we're advocating for policy and we're advocating for legislation that changes 
the trajectory for the youth and for the families on these pueblos. And I think that that's one thing that I am very proud of and that our policy office for ALA is very proud of being able to participate and to help tell that story. Um, there's more work to be done. Anybody who participates in E-Rate knows that it's not easy, um, but that this story, when we put it together, uh, some of the findings that we have from that uh, talk about what Kimball was mentioning, but the importance of um, the library in bringing people to the table and having that voice to be able to explain what the higher purposes are of broadband access. So it's not just to have it you know, so you can get online, it's to have it so you can do what the Congressman was talking about, take care of health issues, do distance learning, particularly now during the pandemic, um, apply for jobs, apply for benefits, and all of that kind of thing. So um, bringing the library in to be able to share that knowledge with the rest of their community is one of the findings that, that we're um, very pleased to have had brought home to us. Um, in terms of, of what we think uh, some recommendations are, we would like to see the FCC right now take action to um, address the definition of a tribal library. This is something that happened in um, when E-rate was initiated and put into place. And I know that the Congressman's tel um, Tribal Connect Act is meant to address that issue. We think that the FCC can also take action on it. And my point in raising that is one that, that we think about all the time as ALA's policy wing is that it's the rules and the language in legislation that really dictate what is enabled. So when Kimball was talking about the rule changes to the E-rate program, until those changes came into place, none of what they were able to accomplish in the two consortia projects would have been able to happen. So it really took kind of fundamental advocacy work to make the case for why this kind of project should be allowed. Um, and I want to be mindful of, of time, uh, but I did want to also say um, that to be able to tell this story and share it back to the FCC, back to Capitol Hill, back to other federal offices, um, I think that we can continue to make improvements for other tribal libraries that have not yet been able to do this. So I wanted to thank um, the Pueblos that were involved for allowing ALA to help share the work uh, nationally. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marika. And, and, and going back to uh, Capitol Hill and just thinking about policy, I want to go back to Congressman Luan because um, there's so much uh, broadband related legislation and you mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, it's just so hard to keep track of. But what do you think is most promising and necessary to improve broadband connectivity in tribal libraries and for Indian country more broadly? Well, Ms. Bisser just addressed one of the areas that could change tomorrow. Um, the FCC does not have to wait for Congress to act to expand eligibility. And, and it, that's, that's not, not even an accurate way of saying it, Mr. Jefferson, of making sure that the interpretation of the way that the law was written does include expansive areas in tribal and public communities. What the Tribal Connect Act does is it recognizes that not all tribal communities have tribal libraries. Now, it's our goal to make sure we're investing so that every tribal community does have a tribal library, but until that happens, why not allow the tribes to be able to designate another uh, community uh, gathering place, uh, for example, in the Navajo Nation with each of the chapter houses as eligible for E-rate. So that way, all of the investments that are being made qualify for that facility as well. That's going to be critically important. The FCC can do several things uh, in addition to how E-rate is being uh, utilized today. So in communities that are connected uh, for families that can't afford internet access or where they're not ha hardwired to their home, there's no reason that the FCC cannot allow for the purchase of hotspots uh, to be shared with those students today, tablets, notebooks, so that way they have the hardware to be able to take advantage of that connectivity. That's another tool that we are going to have to change if the FCC does not voluntarily do that. And several of us have been working on initiatives like that. Congresswoman Deb Holland, one of the first two Native American women elected to the United States House of Representatives, has several initiatives as well that we're co-sponsors of to help broaden um, the investment that we're looking at into these communities. And it's 
one of the provisions that I named earlier, which is an infrastructure investment package. There is going to be money needed to be able to close this divide. So that $100, million, $100 billion initiative that I shared with the broadband uh, gap that needs to be closed, there's an $80 billion initiative that qualifies for uh, libraries um, uh, in tribal communities. Uh, the CARES Act uh, it also included a set aside for tribal communities, as does the HEROES Act. So now that we are negotiating this next round of funding, understanding that this is a, a, a pandemic that is not going away anytime soon, those dollars need to be released to make more investments in tribal communities. So every one of these programs matters. There's no reason that a one of them should be delayed, Mr. Jefferson, whether it's administratively or agreed to in the package. So all we need right now is for Republican leader Mitch McConnell and the U.S. Senate allow these bills to go forward. Let's act, get a vote on the Senate floor, and uh, President Trump, please sign them into law. And there will be new resources made available soon. Um, absent that, it's going to be incumbent that we work into the next calendar year. But we just we 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 have to be relentless in this pursuit. Um, the good news is is that with leaders uh, like the ones you have assembled on the call today, Mr. Jefferson, they've showed us the path to get this done. Now, what we need to do is get out of their way and make sure that they have the resources to get it done. All right. Thank you so much. I, hear, hear, Congressman. Um, we're going to go to take a couple of questions. I have a couple of questions now. Um, we I have just a few minutes, but I want to get some of the questions in. The first question is, uh, what can the larger library community do to support our colleagues in tribal libraries? Who wants to take that question? All right, go ahead. I was just gonna say, speak out, be an, be an ally. And uh, when a tribal issue comes up, it's really an issue for everybody since we want everybody to have that equal access to opportunity. So I think be an ally. And um, Aaron, you wanna jump in here as well? Yes, um, I think a big thing is reach out. Um, if you don't know what our struggles are, you can't be a good ally. And that's one thing through the American Indian Library Association we're realizing is that there's so little knowledge about what tribal libraries are and that we even exist that uh, people use that as the, as the reason to ignore that we're struggling out here. Um, I'm going to go to another question. Um, what are your thoughts about using TV white space to get rural and reservation lands more connected? Who wants to take? Kimball. <laughs> so I did put it in the chat as well. The white space is, it's, you know, every, this spectrum, all these wireless flavors of wireless have characteristics. So the characteristics of the white space is it travels a long distance, but it only sends through a little bit of data. So if you want fast, that's not going to be your permanent um, solution and we know how quickly with the internet of things the demand for broadband just is growing um, and then you have to look at availability so when we did entertain um, working on two white space projects and the majority of the tribes in new mex in the pueblo they should say we're not eligible because we didn't have enough um, unused channels you needed three contiguous ones to you know do a good uh, get a good network connection um, just because we were too close to towns with albuquerque and santa fe so where it can work, I think it has its place, but just as a general, this is a solution that's going to fit most people. Um, we, we can't say that about white space. Thank you. Um, we are at the top of the hour and we have to close. One of the things that I've said at the end of each of these tour stops uh, is that these are important conversations that will not end here. Um, I will say that I really, really, really wish that I could have been uh, with you all in person because I was so looking forward to being in New Mexico. I really, really was. But I am so glad that we were able to have this conversation today where we had over 170 people join us. So, so thank you. Um, I want to thank um, uh, Maureen, Mr. Sando, Kimball. What an amazing example of innovation and cooperation to increase connectivity. Uh, there shouldn't have have to be uh, so many obstacles in your way. And I feel like we've heard some constructive ideas about how to address some of those obstacles. Aaron, Marika, thank you for helping us understand how these stories fit into the national picture. 
Thank you so much to Congressman Lujan for your support of libraries and for your efforts to ensure connectivity for communities. If we can be of service to you in helping libraries bring additional resources and opportunities to residents in your district, please, please let us know. I wanna thank uh, our co-host, New Mexico State Library and the American Indian uh, Library Association. We appreciate your partnership. I wanna give a shout out to ALA members who are with us today. I know that this is an issue of concern for our members across the country. And now I wanna say, please join me tomorrow at 1 p.m. Central for a conversation at Cordes Lakes Public Library where we will be joined by library workers who serve rural communities across Arizona. Visit the tour website for more information, watch for my notes from the road and follow the entire tour at hashtag ALA holding space. Keep advocating for your communities and libraries and ask your elected officials to support the Library Stabilization Fund Act. I wanna leave you with stay safe, be well, and thank you for holding space with us today. Thank you so much.